Welcome to Podcasting Smarter, the podcast for podcasters by podcasters. Podcasting Smarter is the official podcast from Podbean, featuring podcasting interviews, best practices, and helpful tips. We're here to give you the tools, resources, product updates, and news to help you get started podcasting and keep your podcast growing. Hello, and welcome to Podcasting Smarter. This is Norma Jean Belenke, Podbean's Head of Events. And in today's episode, we'll be speaking with Fei Fei, who's the founder of Nija Pod Hub, where we'll get into becoming a podcast service provider, editing podcasts, podcasting on the African continent and within Nigeria, and so much more. Stay tuned, and here we go. Hi, Fei Fei, how's it going? Hi, Norma, how are you doing? Good. We are so excited to speak with you. And for those of us that joined, for everyone who joined our event with Global Podcast Editors, you were a part of it, but the connection, we had a couple issues. So we wanted to have you back on Podcasting Smarter so we could hear your story and hear all about Nija Pod Hub, <laughs> podcasting in Nigeria, becoming an editor, and all of the work that you do. So hello and welcome. Thank you. It's glad it's great to be here. And yeah, sorry about the connection that day. We don't know what happened, but I'm happy we get to have a do-over. Yes, me too. Absolutely. That's what happens with live. But so tell everybody a bit about you because you're the founder of Nigel Pod Hub and you have a couple of podcasts yourself. One's called The Fray, Previously On, and The Unusual. So tell us a little bit about your podcasts, how you started Nigel Pod Hub, and then how you got into podcasting. Okay, so well, again, my name is Fei Fei. Um, I am a trained computer engineer, but I uh, decided to choose a different career path um, once I graduated because something about computer engineering felt too much like work and strain, and I was just having a bit of difficulty. I just had this interest in the entertainment sector and radio and music and all of that. And tried to start a career in music, but it was a bit overwhelming at the time as well. So I decided to work on radio. And then starting my internship in, on radio in 2012, I was put in the production department. And, you know, that's where I discovered a love for audio content. You know, um, I listened to a lot of radio programs. I listened to a lot of radio dramas and all of that, you know. But even at the time, I wasn't really focused on trying to make my own stuff I just enjoyed consuming all of that content and so I started doing voiceovers at some point and making radio jingles and when I was you know fully ready or fully certain about what next I wanted in my career I applied for another radio job as a presenter and because of my skills in production, they decided to make it a, a double role where sometimes I'm a presenter and sometimes I'm a producer. And I started doing that in 2015. And it was when I started this new radio job at Sound City Radio in Lagos, Nigeria, that a friend of mine said, you know what, I think you would like this program. And she shared a podcast with me. And I listened to that and I was just like, Hmm, I want to make mine. <laughs> and so that was when I first started trying to make a podcast. You know, I listened to a lot of podcasts at the time, tried to understand how to structure mine, what to do to try and make mine better and all of that. And that was when I started the Unusual Podcast. And that was just a conversation with friends about the happenings in the entertainment industry and all of that. And there wasn't too much research or structure put into that it was just whatever you find interesting on social media come and let's talk about it and so we did that and then I just had an itch to make more and more and more and at the time I thought oh sh or should I start a podcast network <laughs> with zero money zero equipment or studio time and I started another one called previously on which talked about like tv series or tv shows and so a friend of mine and I, Rachel, would watch, you know, several TV shows and just come and talk about it from start to finish. And the other one, The Fray, came from a love of music where I just have this 
a very diverse taste in music and sometimes I can tell if a song is going to go far or not in terms of on the charts and all of that. And so we started doing like a music review type podcast and introducing new music to the scene based on what we've listened to or what people send to us to listen to. Yeah, so that's how I got into podcasting. And then at some point, because of my production and editing skills, I thought about it that there will come a time where there will be loads and loads and loads of podcasts in Nigeria and people would need an editor, producer, um, someone who could help them shape their content or so a content developer or someone who could create content for them to use to promote their businesses. And so I started to shape my mind and my business in that space where I would want to be in every conversation about podcasting. I would want to share as many um, things I've learned on my journey of podcasting with as many people as I could find at zero cost. And then I thought, you know what, why not start a community, you know? And then I started this community called Niger Pod Hub. And initially it was just a Twitter page where I would share every single Nigerian podcast that I found, creating this like directory. And so over time, a lot of people gravitated towards it. People started asking questions, oh, how do I do this and do that? And then I met this lady who had built up a WhatsApp group of podcasters and then I collaborated with her and we became, you know, um, partners. So her WhatsApp group was now the WhatsApp group for the Nigerian podcast community. And so that's how things just started growing and growing from there. Um, international recognition started coming in from like Africa and then from the rest of the world where people are like, oh, how do we get to Nigerian podcasters? I work with brands like um, Africa Podcast Fest, which is um, having a celebration in 2023 in February. I've worked with Google, Podbean now on this uh, interview, just chatting. And so many others, Podpage and all of that, just trying to expose the Nigerian uh, community to all of the tools they could use to be better podcasters. And we would usually have loads and loads of events for start starting podcasters or new podcasters just to show them the ropes um, give them all the resources that they need and we've had like a few in-person events as well just to bring the community together from just having an online presence into having physical presence so um if i've not missed anything else that has kind of been my journey since I discovered podcasting up until now, where I just basically produce podcasts for my clients and a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And and how big is the community in Nigeria in terms of podcasters? It's not too big, but I'd say it's somewhere around four to five thousand people at this time, including Nigerians in the diaspora. You know. Loads and loads of people discover podcasting every day. Um, in our WhatsApp group, we have at least uh, 400 people. On Twitter, we have close to 2,000. Same on Instagram. And, um, and there's other people who are podcasting but haven't yet become members of the community. Yeah, they so, haven't found you guys yet. And for everybody listening, yeah. Nigeria has quite a large population, right? I think it's... Yes. I think it's, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about 100 million? I, I'm not sure. You know, okay, well, we'll look it up and we'll have it for you, for you guys later if you're listening. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting because, you know, podcasting so far has really been, you know, major, the majority of podcasts have come from the U.S. or from the Western world. So mm-hmm. in terms of, of someone who's really creating that community in Nigeria, what do you want people to know about the stories and the perspectives coming from Nigeria? Okay, so first I want them to know that these perspectives exist. <laughs> and so that's why we try our best to like, you know, put the, Niger- the Nigerian podcast community out there as much as possible. And another thing I would like them to know is that, you know, because of the way the world is now, it's all a game of numbers. So if you're not somebody who already racks up a lot of numbers in terms of your social media presence and everything, your content might be hiding and it might just be like a diamond in the rough type thing. 
So yes, you might find the popular ones that are similar to a lot of the chat casts that you find out there, but there are podcasters in the community with fewer numbers who are doing amazing work. If I if you'd say what I really want people to know is there's a lot of people who have great content and great ideas, but do not have the funds to execute them or the resources to execute them. And if anyone's interested in telling like or hearing amazing stories from Africa or supporting amazing stories from Nigeria, that there's, there's so many people who just have ideas sitting on their hands that you could collaborate with or reach out to to tell these amazing stories. Yeah, absolutely. And and just to just to clarify, the population of Nigeria is over 200 million people. <laughs> we just looked exactly. it up. So, so it's a I large think when you said yeah. million. It sounded like a lot, but then it sounded few as well. So I was like, oh, well, 100 sure. million does sound like a lot, but 200 million is definitely bigger. Um <laughs> And it's true, you know, as, you know, as podcasting grows, that population is going to jump in and become more involved. So it is really exciting that you've, you know, been on the forefront of podcasting within Nigeria and creating community there and, you know, plugging people in, engaging people, not only to support each other, but to, you know, create content, which is so special. Um, And I'd love to get into editing now because you work as a professional editor and and podcast producers. So what would you tell yourself if you went back to the beginning? Because I think everybody kind of, you know, starts on the professional podcasting journey differently. You definitely have that radio background and production side, but in terms of, you know, becoming a professional editor, starting that business as a podcast service provider, you know, if you had to go back to square one, what would you tell yourself? Hmm, if I had to go back to square one, what I would tell myself is that I should have, or or maybe <laughs> learned a lot more earlier, like a lot, be more deliberate about the the practices that I picked up along the way. Yeah. Um, and I say that because a lot of times, for for me on my personal journey, um, it was just doing what I saw others do without having like a full understanding of why they were doing what they did you know, in terms of the profession. And that also came from their inability to explain why they did things a certain way, right? So I would have educated myself more on editing from the start. Because I think, you know, when you start learning something and you just pick up funny habits from the people that you learn from, it takes... I think it makes it a little bit harder to sh- to shake off some of those things. Um, yeah, to change um, habits later, it's better to learn yeah. them specifically. <laughs> so are there any specific practices or habits that you're referring to in terms of, you know, learning them maybe the right way or a specific way in the beginning? Yeah, so, okay, I can speak to like being very orderly in terms of labeling your files and having folders where you put things and, you know, being very careful about, you know, losing those files, like, um, because of how, again, like I learned, it, it just, th- there was no like, okay, this is how you do this and do this. So you don't, you know, mix up your files or lose your files. And um, there's also a lot to do with like, okay, working or processing audio. Like this is what good audio should sound like, or this is what you do when audio sounds like this or like that, you know, a lot of generic things were just being done just because, you know. Yeah. Just because people think this is what should be done. Oh, um, I'm a producer. I'm supposed to put EQ on an audio file. So let's put EQ, okay? So why? Because there are times when I've been given an audio file and just because I have learned that I should put EQ on an audio file, I would do that. And sometimes some mic settings are already done in such a way that you don't need to do so much. So I end up even causing more problem, <laughs> problems for the audio. Yeah. And yeah. for everybody out there listening who maybe uh, doesn't know, EQ is like an equalizer. It's like a, you yeah. know, it's just about equalizing the audio within a file. And it's so interesting. You know, I think it's something where, you know, doing things just for the sake of doing them, but without knowing the reason really doesn't enable mm-hmm. you to grow. So it's it's so important if you're learning tools, if you're learning a specific DAW, which is a digital audio workspace, anything like that, to just make sure that you're familiar with that. I, I really love that. 
And I want to also ask, because pod fade or podcast burnout is so big in the podcasting community. You know, so many people have these great ideas for podcasts and kind of, you know, I don't want to say we get ahead of ourselves, but we don't maybe think about everything that goes into a podcast before we start it, right? In terms of mm-hmm. production capabilities and how much time things are going to take and the editing and the marketing and all of that. So um, how do you get around pod fade and, and what do you do to create sustainable success for yourself and the clients that you work for? Okay, so for that, I try to pace myself really. Um, so initially when I started, I used to do this these runs of like, oh, every week there's an episode, every week there's an episode. And quickly you do realize that, you know, you're burnt out, you're tired, um, and you are not able to put out episodes as, as often as you should. And that break, of course, causes listeners to either go look for something else or just stray away and you might not get those listens back. So over time, what I started doing was having these, what I say, seasonal type ideas where it's like, okay, whatever podcast I'm doing, how many episodes make up a season for me? How many weeks am I going to be on break? What am I going to be doing when I'm on break um, to enable me jumpstart, you know, into the next season when I'm back. I think another thing I thought about as well was, you know, do I want to do a podcast that is time sensitive and that, that, that shares information that is time sensitive? And do I have the capacity to continue doing that type of podcast? You know, so if my focus with my podcast is talking about trending stuff and maybe bringing new information to people on a weekly basis, do I have what it takes to ensure that I put all of that information together? And initially as well, when I started, a lot of work was just me because again, I have the editing skills. I have access to a studio. I was the one who consumed a lot of podcasts. So I knew how I wanted things to do, to go or sound. But over time, you know, I started learning that, look, I can't do it all. And there are people I know who are even better at content than I am. So it became a thing of, okay, then I need to delegate, right? So I'll do the recording and the editing. Somebody else, please do the research on what we're going to talk about today and send it in maybe two or three days before so everybody else can take a look. And aside that person doing that, you know, if anybody has any information as well, share it and we can add to it. Who's going to handle social media, which is a huge part of it because I think it's an underestimated side, but that's where like you market your podcast and put out all the information. So there needs to be thought as to how you're going to manage that. If you're going to use a scheduling platform or if you're going to hire someone, if you do have the means to, to take care of the social media for you. And if you're going to have like, you know, little virtual events or even in-person events to promote your own podcast community, like, for example, the Fray, let's say, maybe have listening parties or whatnot just for that. Uh, So, yeah, like I decided, okay, 10 to 13 episodes make up a season for me. And so after that, I could take maybe a three weeks break and then another three weeks to prep for the next season, and then I'm back. So those times in between just helps to refresh a little bit to help manage that pod fade or or exhaustion that you feel, you know, when podcasting. With my clients, I usually just advise them the same. And before they start, I make sure that they are aware what it takes. I know I've had somebody come to me and say, oh, I want to start a podcast. What do you think I should do? And then I explain all of these things to her, like, okay, this is how this happens. This is how that happens. You're going to have a, in a year, you have about 52 weeks. Um, do you want to do a bi-weekly podcast or a weekly podcast? Do you have equipment? And when we're done talking, she was like, oh, wow, I, I never thought about all of these many things. And I'm like, yeah, these are the things you should think about. And also, I need you to be very aware at this time that it's not that quickly you get, you know, money for plays. Yeah, exactly. Your audience doesn't grow. I think setting those client expectations are so smart, right? You know, Mm -hmm. it's interesting because 
you know, as a podcast service provider, you probably want people to, <laughs> to hire you. But at the yeah. same time, it's like, Hey, I'm not a magician. You know, this is a lot of work. <laughs> exactly. Are you up for it? Are you up for exactly. being, you know, my ideal client, you know, because this is how I work. So I think that that's really important as well. And, you know, I love the idea of having a season. You know, I think a lot of a lot of podcasters coming in think, oh, well, maybe I'll just have less frequent episodes. But a lot of the time, if you're going to do that, you may have more success just condensing them down into a weekly series that has a limited run per season. So you still get that momentum. People still, you know, will listen and binge episodes. And then when the season's over, they're, you know, they, they're a bit disappointed, but then they're excited to wait for the next season. Absolutely. Exactly. So I think that that's a great way of of putting it. And in terms of getting clients as a podcast service provider, let's talk about that because, you know, th- there's so many w- different ways to build a podcasting business. So what are some of the ways that you started and the ways that you found clients? Okay. Um, I know people say word of mouth is, you know, the best way to get cl- your work out there and clients and all of that. But to be honest, I've never really been that person that finds themselves talking about their work, you know, every gathering they are or at every opportunity that they get. So my own strategy, and which I'd say has worked for me, is doing excellent work, right? So with every project that I have or every client that I get, I just try my best, you know, to first of all, deliver on the time that I've given the client that I'll deliver. So if I say, okay, we're going to record, say in two weeks, and then maybe in six weeks, I'm going to give you your project or in two months, I'm going to give you your project. I try to stay on time. Um, I try to give my client the best feedback that I can and all of that. And just basically try to be as professional as I can, you know? And what then happens is people hear the work, And they're like, okay, who did this, right? And from there, the client shares my contact and I'm able to get the next client, which I treat exactly the same way. And aside that, you know, once in a while, because I'm not even really a social media buff like that, once in a while I can come on social media and just make like a really long thread about tips, resources, you know, podcasting, good practices, sometimes even share a whole podcast idea that if I was a podcaster, I would make a podcast about this. And this is how I would go about it and all of that. I also try to be part of podcasting events. And then with my community, every time we're having a conversation, I always come from the angle of being a podcast editor or an audio producer. So when somebody is somewhere and they're having a conversation, they'll be like, oh yeah, Feifei does this. Or I've heard Feifei speak about this. Why not reach out? You know, and so that's how I, you know, generally get clients um, for my work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's something where, you know, community plays such a big aspect. It plays such a big part. It's such a big aspect in podcasting, whether it's, you know, your community of podcasters that you know virtually, whether you go to in-person events, whether you're leading a community, it really does make a difference um, in terms of finding clients as a podcast service provider. We've heard that from from quite a few guests here on Podcasting Smarter. And um, I also want to ask about rates because, you know, learning what to charge is so interesting because podcasting is such a new medium and you know so many podcast service providers have different journeys maybe they start out in traditional radio or maybe they start out having their own podcast editing it learn to edit and then you know take on clients so how did you learn what to charge hmm. okay so with that it's it always starts off as a personal journey like when you realize that okay this is a service that you can offer you know you really do start to think of what to charge for it. But I think, I don't know, but I'll tell you, most people (laughs) always start off charging less (laughs) because they're also trying to understand, you know. Oh, yeah, I was going to say there are most people charge less because they don't know what the work is worth or they want to, you know, see what what the market dictates. But podcasting as an industry is so new. Yeah, so so because it's still new, um, it's not something... Or at the time, it wasn't something where 
you would just go online and say, okay, rates for this, rate for that when it comes to podcasting and you would find. These days, you know, if you join a few communities, you know, they, they, they'd say things like anybody who posts an opening here must post the rates so we can know that no one's being underpaid. But for me, I'd say I started off charging the bottom of the bottom. So about maybe uh, twenty dollars. Oh wow. That makes okay. Sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about twenty dollars to edit maybe five episodes of a podcast. Oh my right? gosh. Okay. That's, yeah, that's not even <laughs> at that point, you're really just doing it for experience. Yeah. And for word of yeah. mouth. So from there, exactly. I think, you know, you probably worked on on developing the rates that you have now, but it's definitely mm-hmm. a journey for every podcaster. And it's interesting to to kind of understand, you know, once you get enough work, do you increase your mm-hmm. rates because, you know, your time is more valuable? That's also something that we've heard a lot of podcasters talk about. Mm, I think over time for me, it just became a thing of understanding that this work I do is 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 it's a tough job. I'll put it that way, you know, and I started, fe- I started going with my gut feeling of, you know, will I feel satisfied if I charge this client this amount of money? And also with, with, with experience, we're working with clients. For example, if I say, okay, I charge someone $20 for four or five episodes, right? And this person becomes or turns out to be somebody who's really picky with what they want to hear and how they want to hear it and has me edit this episodes four or five times, right? Then it absolutely doesn't make sense for me. So I started putting things like that into consideration where I'm like, okay, let's just assume that for some reason, after I edit this podcast the first time, the client is going to ask me to edit it two to three other times, right? So I put that into consideration when I'm trying to put together a rate. Yeah, Um, absolutely. Are you going to have any re-edits? Are you going to have any revisions? That's such an important, that's such, yeah, that's such an important thing to remember because, you know, when you're starting a business, you think, oh, maybe I'm just going to edit this podcast. You know, it's an hour podcast, Mm -hmm. however long it takes me to edit. But then there's the communication around it. There's the getting the client, there's the, Mm -hmm. any revisions or any edits or anything like that. So that's, that's really, yeah, wise, I think to include as well. And, yeah. and we've had other podcast service providers also talk about how, you know, maybe they have a set number of revisions, right? So, okay, here's my rate, yeah. but it includes maybe two revisions, something like that yeah. as well. So I said, that absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of, in terms of people who are just beginning that journey as a podcast service provider or looking to become a podcast service provider, maybe you have a podcast, you edit it and you're thinking, oh, maybe other people will want you know to hire me as an editor. What are some tips and best practices you can offer for people just starting that journey? Hmm. Okay. If you're just starting your journey as a podcast editor, I would say don't overbook yourself until you know like what you can handle by yourself. Um, what I mean is don't have too many clients at the same time because that can be exhausting for you. And also you might not be able to fully dedicate time to one client, you know, or to each client as much as you should. So understanding your capacity. I know that, you know, I don't know, for some people, for me personally, um, I did not start off as podcast editing or audio editing being the only job that I had. I was still working full-time for a while. Um, so obviously I was always taking, you know, just one or two jobs here and there. And when I decided that I wanted to go solo, then I decided, to, then I started taking on more. So pace yourself, understand yourself. Don't sell to your client what you can't do. Right. Don't give them a false dream of how you're going to miraculously turn audio that was not recorded properly into the best sounding audio. So always tell them that, look, I can work on your audio file, but it also depends on the recording conditions. Right. So if you've not recorded in a quiet place or in a good environment for good quality audio, I can't miraculously turn, you know, all of that into Great audio. There's only so much the plugins can do. So if you are able to give them advice on how to 
properly record in a quiet place so that at least, you know, what they're saying is comprehensible and people can hear what they're saying. Also, if you can have like a test run with the client. So it's like, okay, you want to do this with me? Let's do a three episode run and see how that goes and see if it's a good fit for us to work together. Because um, as an editor, you need your mind to be clear at all times. So if you have a client that is difficult to work with and keeps giving you so much stress and complaints that are unrealistic and problems, you know, that might be taken away from your sanity and your mental space for you to properly be creatively editing the other things you're supposed to do. Yeah. So those are just a few things I would say. Oh, that's, that's really helpful. I think for everyone out there. Well, Feifei, it's been such a pleasure. We have a couple of questions that we ask everybody at the end of Podcasting Smarter episodes. So in your opinion, where do you believe the industry is headed? Hmm. The industry is headed into like a space where I think, or I believe, it's going to be heavily competing with picture because people are getting a lot more creative with the things they do. People are getting a lot more deliberate, intense, and emotive with the stories they want to tell, um, where it's now like picture hears this and they want to turn it into, you know, a movie or a film, things like that. So it's rapidly growing. There's so much space now for a truckload of creatives, you know, so it's not just the audio guys that are at the forefront anymore. The script writers are there. The researchers are there. The investigative journalists are there. Um, and the voice talents, the voice actors, you know. So it's just growing every day. And I think it's also making people think of other ways in which they could consume audio or other ways in which they could creatively, you know, put out a concept or an idea. That's what it's done, you know, in the... Um, I would say in the short time <laughs> that it's become really global, you know, so that that's an industry that people should watch out for in the, in the future, you know, in, in the next coming years, actually, like it's really a strong industry growing in, at a fast proportion every other day and people getting way, way, way creative as to how to monetize, create, distribute and all of that. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and what are the podcasts that you like to listen to? Hmm. I'm very interested in um, storytelling podcasts or audio dramas, audio series. Recently, I've been listening to Sola because I'm a big fan of CJ Dromella. And aside that, I listen to a few chat casts. The Read, Brilliant Idiots, um, just a lot of those. And... Basically, anything someone recommends to me and says, check this out, you know. I recently got into a few documentaries and, you know, I'm currently working with a team that's making one. And it's um, been an interesting experience, you know. Um, so, yeah, documentaries, dramas and chat casts. But I easily get tired of chat casts, you know, depending on what is being said. But those are my faves right now or do you want me to be more specific and mention yeah there's any shows shout them out (laughs) okay um everybody should listen to stolen surviving st michael's it's uh, ah, oh my crazy crazy that's one one documentary that is a thing where i never saw it coming (laughs) started listening to it and the story just blew me away also south lake was good let me see um, then I started listening to the 11th hour and the truth, um, snap judgment. So yeah, those are a few. Oh, those are some good ones. Well, Fei, <laughs> it has been such a pleasure to have you join us today on Podcasting Smarter. How can everybody get in touch with you? Okay. Um, everywhere on social media, my handles are I am the Feifei. So I am T-H-E-F-A-Y-F-A-Y. Also, my website, I'm the Feifei. I'm on LinkedIn as my government name, Ife Odudu. Um, but through all these other links, you'll be able to find me on LinkedIn. 
Um, you could just send me a message anytime. You could just put podcast as the subject and that would interest me. Or you could try joining my community, Niger Pod Hub. We have a website. We have several groups across social media, WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups, um, Facebook groups. So through there, you'll be able to contact me. Absolutely. And we'll have the link to Niger Pod Hub here in the show notes. Feifei, thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Podcasting Smarter. If you have any podcasting questions or want to get in touch, send us an email at podcastingsmarter at podbean.com. Thanks so much and happy podcasting.